Today we're going to look at potential energy curves. That is, what do you do when you have a potential energy, but you want to know things about force? Um, this is a little complicated. I'm going to try and guide you through a chain of logic here, uh, but it's going to take a little while, and so this might be two videos. Look for a part two. Okay, first I'm going to go with an example. So you remember force, the force of gravity. If I want the work done by gravity, well, the work was the negative change in potential energy, remember? Because when something was falling, the force of gravity was down and the thing was moving down. So the force and the distance that it moved were in the same direction, so work would have been positive. But the change in potential, well, it lost height. So its change in height was negative, which means its change in potential energy was negative. But uh, since work was force times distance, the force was mg, and then the distance it was fell was h, so these ended up being equal to each other. Okay, I just want you to keep this in mind right here. Just keep that in your head. Alright, well, I also know that work is f of x, like force times distance, the times the change of x. Okay, so if I put those two together, I get that the change of potential energy is equal to negative f times the change of x. Usually we say fd, d being change of x, but d is something we used in conceptual physics, and now we're using delta x. Okay, if you solve for um, f, and, well, we have to, okay, so if we solve for x, that would be dividing by del delta x on both sides. Solve for x, or solve for f. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put this negative on the other side as well, just just moving it over, so basically multiplying both sides by negative 1. What I get is I get f equals um, negative change in potential over change in x. Now here's the thing, delta delta means change, so this would be an average force, and the average force is the negative change in potential energy over the whole movement divided by the entire distance it was moved, or displacement it was moved. Now, if I instead say, the in, say, hey, let's not do averages, let's make this delta, this chain, smaller and smaller and smaller until we've got infinitesimal little steps, well, that's a differential. In that case, I wouldn't have average f, I would have force at a specific point, f of x, and I would get that it is the um, derivative of the potential energy if the potential energy is given as an equation of x and then it would be dx. So basically I make these really really small, they become d's, and, like, I, this is going to sound really stupid, but these are like capital deltas and these are little tiny deltas. Usually when we do that, the lowercase deltas doesn't quite look like a d, but it's it's close. Anyway, um, now keep in mind this is for one dimensional motion. That's important. Uh, dimensional motion. Okay. Alright, so we can check this. Let's go ahead and check this. Um, check this. Make sure that it's true. Okay, so for instance, I know that the energy stored in a spring with uh, as a function of position is one half times or k over two, really k over two times x squared, where x is the um, distance the screw string has been displaced from equilibrium position. Okay, I also know that. Uh, I also know what the force should be for a spring, so let's just check and see if that's true. If I do that the force is the inverse, f of x is the inverse, or not inverse, why do I keep saying that? Ugh. The <laughs> negative 
of du dx. Well, then I've got a negative. And then I've got to take the derivative of this. Well, I've got a k over 2 is a constant, so leave it there. Then I bring the exponent down in front, so I've got a 2. And then I subtract 1, so I've got x to the first, so that's just x. What I get is that the force of a spring is negative, all the 2's go away, negative kx. Oh, well that's true. That's Hooke's law. So hey, look, that did work if we use the en potential energy stored in a spring as a function of x and took the derivative, we get the force as a function of x. Ta-da! It does work. Okay, so what are the consequences of that? Well, it means if I have a graph of potential energy as a function of x, I can learn things about the force simply by looking at the graph. So I'm just going to sketch a random graph um, for example purposes. So this is the potential energy as a function of x. Uh, so this is x. Okay. And let's just say that the graph did something like, oh gosh, I don't know, down and then up again and then down again and uh, how about like that. Okay. And um, I'm not going to put numbers down here. Instead, I'm just going to name them off. Let's say this is like x1 and say where it touches is x2 and then like right where it peaks again is x3 and where it dips again is x4 and then when it levels off we'll call that x5. Alright, so looking back at this equation over here, remember that a derivative gives you a slope. So what I'm really saying is force is the negative slope of this graph. So for example, at uh, let's see, in this section right here, the slope is a negative, so the force would actually be positive at this between x1 and x2. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Um, similarly, come on colors, here we go. Uh, how about orange? Right along here from x2 to x3, I would have a, the, the slope is positive, so the force would actually be negative, okay? And where the slope is zero, the force would be zero. So the force is zero at x2 and x3 and x4. Um, the force is positive between x1 and x2, between x3 and x4. Oh, come on. Let's use, continue to use this funny blue color for... So, okay, so the slope would be positive here, and the slope would be, or sorry, the, the force would be net positive here, and then the force would be negative here. So if I wanted to try and sketch a graph of force, oh, I can already tell I'm going to suck at this one. Let's try it, though. Let's see, force. Um, I'm going to have to scooch. I need room for negatives, so I'm going to have to scooch this up force is a function of x, so I'm going to keep these lined up, x3, x4, x5, okay, what did we say? We said, okay, well, wherever the slope was, po was zero, the force will be zero. So at x2, I should have my force crossing to have zero. So I'm going to I'm going to cross the x axis here and here and here. Okay. Then between x1 and this, oh and then up here I'm almost at zero and over here I'm basically at zero. In fact, after x5 the slope is zero, so force should be zero. So I'm going to whoops, come on. Come on. I'm going to end up like this. I should make this a thicker line. Here we go. Okay. Also, here at the beginning, before x1, it was really, really shallow, and slightly, but slightly negative. So that would mean the force is really, really small, but slightly positive. Um, 
before x1, so it would be like this maybe. And then it gets really, the slope gets really, really negative. So that would mean that the force got really, really positive from somewhere in between uh, x1 and x2. So it probably does something, whoop, it kind of goes up like this. And then it's got to get back down to that 0. Then between x2 and x3, the slope is positive. So that means force would be negative, but it's got to get back to 0. So it's probably something like this. And then again, slope becomes negative, so the force must be positive, but it's got to get back down to zero, so it's probably something like this. And then from x4 to x5, the slope is positive, so the force would be negative, but it's got to get back down to zero, so it's probably something like this. So what we have here is some force that's oscillating back and forth, positive, negative, positive, negative. You can't see me, but I'm wagging my head back and forth, too. Um, yeah, anyways, so I can kind of sketch out what the force would look like as a function of x as well. Or if I wanted to, I could figure out um, what it was at certain points by finding the actual slope. Now, I don't have an equation for actual u, so I can't actually get an equation for force. But if I did, I'd take the derivative. Now, I can also do some crazy stuff involving kinetic energy. So I want you to remember, I don't know how long ago this was, but um, energy is conserved. So the total energy of something is its kinetic plus its potential. So let's say that we had a particle that had a total energy um, of, gosh, I don't know. How about, uh, put some numbers on here. I'm going to put it right. No, come on. I'm going to put it right along here. Oh, wow, that sucks. Come on. Uh, can't draw a straight line without a ruler. OK, that's supposed to be straight. Sorry. Pretend it's straight, and it's at the level of this little piece, the thing. Yeah, it's straight. It's straight. <laughs> OK, we're going to call that. That's, that's E. And I'm going to say that it's 5 joules, OK? This is at 5 joules. This is in joules. OK, so we're looking at like 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK? OK. So if kinetic, or sorry, if total energy equals kinetic potential, I could find the kinetic energy, technically, by subtracting u from the total. So I could find kinetic, and since this is as a function of x, it'd be the kinetic energy as a function of x would equal, subtract u from both sides, I'd get e minus potential energy as a function of x. e doesn't get a function of x because it's a, it's a constant. So it's not a function of x, it just is. So if I wanted to find the kinetic energy, technically speaking, all I'd have to do is take 5 and then subtract whatever potential energy was at that time. Or sorry, not at that time, at that place. So for instance, if I wanted to know what the potential, or the sorry, the kinetic energy was at x equals 4, well, this would be the kinetic energy at x equals 4. I would take 5 minus the potential energy at x equals 4, and that would give me the kinetic energy at x equals 4. OK? So kinetic energy can't be negative, ever, ever. So I have a little bit of a conundrum here. Um, there is a little piece of my potential energy curve that kind of sticks up above my um, line, my lavender line here. In fact, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger and a little bit more blatant. Sorry. There. OK, sticks up above my line. The thing is, if I had a particle that was moving around on the x-axis, when it got to here, and let's see, how about bright orange? When it got to right here, so basically left of x equals 1, it could not go any further. Because to do so, it would need more potential energy than 5 
which is what I have. I have a total energy of five. The only way that I could get more potential energy than five is if I borrowed from Kinetic. Basically, Kinetic gave me a loan and Kinetic went into debt and Kinetic became negative. But Kinetic can't become negative. Kinetic is like, it is like a state government. It is not allowed to borrow. Ha 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 ha. Talk to Mr. Mr. Leone about that. Anyway, um, so you can't go into debt with kinetic energy. So you, so that means potential energy cannot borrow, which means potential energy cannot get above five, which means the point can, or the, the object cannot go to the left of x equals one. 